my name is Dave. Uh, that's me. And that's about all I'm going to say about me for tonight, because for this afternoon, because we have three gentlemen up here who are wise and very talented men uh, who I've gotten a chance to learn from while I was here. And I am excited for you guys to hear some of what they have to offer. Um, so first we have, uh, let's see, they're not sitting in the same order as my uh, thing. <laughs> No, 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 we're not going to play musical chairs. Um, on the far end, we have Jonathan Neal. Uh, Jonathan has had uh, 25 years' experience in composing, conducting, producing, and recording large orchestras in Hollywood, London, Nashville, and Budapest, Hungary, for film and TV projects. He also has experience with ethnic music, having recorded and filmed drummers in both Nigeria and Indonesia, working with Indian, Middle Eastern instrumentalists, and singers. Whew. Let's have a hand for Jonathan Neal. Somebody's on it. Uh, Jack Redford is a composer, arranger, orchestrator, and conductor of concert, chamber, and choral music for film, uh, and also for film, television, and theater scores, and music for recordings. He has written scores for more than three dozen feature films, TV movies, or miniseries, including The Trip to Bountiful, One Night with the King, What the Deaf Man Heard, Mama Flora's Family, and Disney's Oliver and Company Newsies and the Mighty Ducks 2 and 3. He has composed the music for nearly 500 episodes of series television, including multiple seasons of Coach and St. Elsewhere. A hand for Jack, please. And uh, Mike Watts immediately to my left, has worked on movies such as The Passion of the Christ, Toy Story 3, The Princess and the Frog, Iron Man 2, there's a long list here, uh, Predators, Valentine's Day, Spider-Man 3, The Princess Diaries 1 and 2, Bruce Almighty, Evan Almighty, Tangled, and television shows. Did you send them all this? <laughs> uh, television shows such as The Simpsons, Dancing with the Stars, and Once Upon a Time. In addition to record work with Christina Aguilera, Brian Wilson, and Roy Orbison, you'd be hard-pressed to walk into any of the Disney theme parks. Uh, around the world and not hear Mr. Watts' work. He teaches at both Biola University and Azusa Pacific. A hand for Mike Watts. So the first question I want to ask you gentlemen is um, briefly, I guess, because we are limited on time, how you got into composing and then especially composing for media because that's something that differentiates what you do um, as part of your work from what a lot of the folks here do as art composers, explicitly art composers. So Mike, you want to start? <laughs> 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 particularly. Um, I comp I mean, there's a difference. I'm gonna Try to put this in a very small nutshell, and I don't have to because I could be here all afternoon talking about this with the feedback, especially. Um, uh, for me, there's a it's a fine line between music and when you make music a business, and and I talk to my students about this sometimes, and it, it, I'm always sort of straddling that line. I feel, for me as a composer, I compose for myself just because that's how I feed me. And I compose commercially, but I don't hang my composer sign on the door and say, I'm a composer, Hollywood, come and get me, because I know I'm not really built for that. Um, I'm, I'm much happier being the guy behind the scene. A composer is in need of help doing X or he's not comfortable doing Y or whatever the case may be, and I, and I do that. A composer these days in Hollywood is, uh, is, 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 you have to be kind of built for the job to succeed, at least in my perspective, from my perspective, because the reality of your day-to-day -day life <coughs> is you sitting in front of a computer sequencing queue after queue after queue for movies, presenting them and getting shot back. And as an orchestrator, for, for me to see version 17 of any particular queue is a common thing. Um, and this poor slob has written this thing 17 times and finally got it you know, bought off on. There's a lot of cues in a movie, generally speaking. 
for me, about version four or five, I wouldn't be the happiest camper in town. Uh, I get to version nine and I really want to, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be. <laughs> I know I'm not built for that. So mm -hmm. I'm much happier getting orchestration across my desk, boom, boom, bing, next, and I'm done. And if they want it redone, well, okay, I'll redo it, and that's next, and uh, it's a simpler way of life. Um, it's, it's, it's less stress in certain ways, and I'm just happier living my, way, my life that way. So to answer your question in a really long and roundabout way, um, I, I, that's sort of how I got into composing is by helping composers, mm. commercially got into composing, is by helping composers, and I still do that. And that's the extent of yeah. <laughs> commercially how it, how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also play on sessions quite I've a bit. I a lot of playing on sessions. Um, yeah, I play piano and a lot of keyboards. And, and occasionally? And, and occasionally an accordion. Yeah, that's right. Yes. <laughs> I'm amazed you admit that in public. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> There used to be a law against it. I think it's still on the books. Yeah, it is. is it it's just unenforceable. Oh, gee, it's not an easy life I lead. You know, I'm, I'm working on a, a SpongeBob SquarePants right now, and there's a lot of, of course. <laughs> and, yeah. It just is not a pretty picture. <laughs> so. It's just one step from Shostakovich, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a little ways from Shostakovich, actually. <laughs> Bill Shostakovich is closer. <laughs> Jack, what about you? How did you start working in film? And I know that you also balance <clears throat> quite a heavy load of both artwork and orchestration and uh, commercial composition. So how have you bridged that gap? How did you get into it? Well, I, I, when, I, when I began working in film, it, I needed a place to make some money, and I wanted to do it um, using my, my music, if I could. I didn't know whether I'd end up in uh, records or in... Um, or in film, but I had some experience doing film, educational films and documentaries coming out of college, so I, um, you know, I just kind of gravitated towards that. The opportunities opened up, but really it was sort of, you could say luck, but here in Biola I think I'd prefer to say Providence. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And um, I have always maintained during the course of my career uh, these two streams. Uh, writing art music for me is my way of of, of keeping my focus on that which is more important. Um, uh, not None of get this sucked, Hollywood drivel. Well, not to get sucked <laughs> into the sort of the Hollywood vortex. You know, it's so easy to be upended and corrupted by right. that system. And one of, one of the ways for me, and I don't think it's normative for everyone necessarily, but for me, uh, it's important to remember with my hands, you know, that music is for something else. Hmm. Um, Fundamentally. Say a little more about that. What is music for? Uh, well, it's as a blessing uh, mm -hmm. to people. It's a form of communication, not just self-expression, uh, by which you are able to sing of the beauties of God's creation back to his people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know, one of the, our unique purposes as human beings for our creation is to be witness to the beauty of God. Right. I think he kind of made us for that. He wanted someone to be witness to, to the beautiful things that he made and to himself, and so we're it. <laughs> we're the ones who get to talk about that. Not, it's different than birds and, and animals. Yeah. We're the only people who actually look at the birds and animals and sort of conceptualize it and, and try and figure out what that means. Right. And beauty is at the root of all of that, and so um, that's our job. Although, for all we know, the birds are commenting about us behind our backs. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> They're too busy just trying to get the food and yeah, <laughs> yeah, get the worms. And, but you know, I mean, so that's for me, art music is the way to stay connected with that aspect of music making. Mm -hmm. um, so that I, there's, I don't require um, film <coughs> to uh, fulfill my my creativity, um, that my my desire for creativity. Mm. If I did that, I'd be really disappointed because uh, film is a business, and. Um, You've got to treat it as a business, really. You've got to be willing to toss out what you wrote yesterday, today. Um, it's just the way it is. You're, you're absolutely right about that. <laughs> so if you're going into film to enjoy uh, you know, creativity, you're going to be uh, probably disappointed. But it is a good business. Uh, and you can you know, be successful at it and use some of your gifts and learn how to apply the things that you, uh, 
you apply in film, you can then apply them back to your art music as you gain more experience working with ensembles and... and um, Jonathan, thank you, Jack. Yeah. What's your story? You've done a lot of work in film and television, a lot of television work. Um, I'm not as familiar with your concert works, but uh, how do you bridge the gap? How is what you do different, and why do you do music? Well, uh, actually, I graduated from Biola uh, many years ago. That's right. Uh, over 30 years ago. And a year after that, I did my first professional recording session with session musicians, and which was very inspiring uh, to me at that point in time. Um, but I got very involved in writing for companies like Maranatha Music, Word, um, uh, oh gosh, Ralph Carmichael's company uh, was still in business in, mm -hmm. and Sparrow was in this town. So I was doing everything from um, copy work to arranging. And um, actually for a, a nameless um, guy who's now in Nashville, I did, did ghosting. And um, I did that for quite a long time. And when a lot of these companies moved to Nashville, a lot of that work went away. And uh, at the same time, I was, I'd always been very interested in film, uh, especially taking uh, Dr. Alicia's classes in 21st century music and, and uh, things that I was writing with Dr. Childs mm -hmm. back when I was here. And uh, so I went to UCLA and, and, and took their film scoring program and started making contacts. And I'd say right off, off the bat, and I think you two would say the thing is you've got to get out and meet people. And that's what I did. And I started doing um, you know, documentaries and, and things like that. And most of my work has been in independent films. Like a, um, I didn't list my credits on that. But um, I just did a feature in England recently. And, yeah. and, um, and I've got a documentary come out in January. So, but that's kind of the short story. So as far as concert music, um, I've always been interested in that. Um, and I've always admired your passion for that, too, and, and just making yourself do it. I've been um, writing. There's a, a lyricist in England. She's the wife of one of the directors that I work with. And we've been um, writing pieces together. And we've, we've got about. Um, We've got about uh, five pieces written and, and a, another ten in the pipeline. So That's great. They're, we're in process and working through that. And uh, and we're not writing pop songs. We're we're actually writing. She her her dream is to do an opera, and we're we're uh, headed towards that goal. And and I really I, I probably work the best uh, in that genre. You know, doing high church music and and uh, and um, opera and and serious yeah. music, so. I'm curious how uh, someone who, uh, as someone who recently graduated, we have some other recent grads in the room, um, I'm coming into a very different business than you guys came into. I'm curious how you have seen it change mm -hmm. as a business, what things you are running into. And I'm asking this question partially because as someone who went through an academic process, realized I, I wasn't interested in writing concert music as my primary goal. Um, I set about to learn as much as I could about the business side of mm -hmm. music. Um, and because I realized as an academic composer, unless you're Ives and you sell insurance and you can write music however you want, a lot of times you have to go and teach. And that wasn't a path that I wanted to go down. So I'm curious for people in the room who may be on that path of teaching and writing concert music, um, or whatever they may be doing, what does the business look like now? How is it different than when you first got into it? Um, and uh, I guess any advice about how to do things differently? Can I jump in on that? Um, yes, please. Uh, my, uh, the biggest difference, uh, in my view, is that it's changed from a craft-driven business to a celebrity-driven business. Mm -hmm. the, uh, when, when I came into the business, you could apprentice and move up through the ranks and learn the craft and have some guarantee of actually working, of getting a job and working. That is no longer the case. And um, you may be one of the lucky ones who actually gets a job, or you may not. And the level of your preparation will not necessarily correspond to your ability to get the work. And that's really a critical thing to know for you who are just coming into the, into the um, coming out of school and looking for your, your life uh, work. 
uh, there is not a guarantee that you will be able to work in, in, as a composer in Hollywood. Now there are a lot of, because um, it's a celebrity driven business, a lot of the people that are the composers of record are not composers, uh, trained composers. And so they need huge armies of people to assist them, uh, orchestrators, copyist arrangers of all kinds. Um, uh, and there is more opportunity than maybe there used to be for that uh, type of ancillary work to be done. Absolutely. And we both benefited yeah, from that. Yeah. Um, but that is a limited field. One of the, one of the things that I tell, um, I tell young composers coming out of school when, when asked uh, that question is that uh, get to know the, the filmmakers that are working in your hometown away from L.A. Uh, mm -hmm. People always want to move to L.A. But schools have been kicking out graduates of film composing programs now for, what, 25 years? Mm -hmm. There's just not enough work. And the, the amount of work has actually gone down, the amount of possible jobs, while schools have been kicking out more composers. So there's more competition for fewer jobs. That is the business landscape that you're looking at. It's just that that is the way it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, which beyond, that's the truth. beyond only making it more difficult for people to get in at all, if they do get in, they're working for, I mean, it's just economics, you're working for such a smaller wage or right. for free, or you that's may never get paid yes. because there's always a guy behind you with GarageBand or Logic or Pro Tools. Well, and that's been another change because the technology's made it possible for the producers to hire their nephews. <laughs> you know, and so you're now can not only competing with other trained composers, but you're also competing with people who have no compositional uh, training whatsoever, but they do have some gear. Yeah. And I call them two-fingered scores. You got one <laughs> finger on atmospheres and one on storm drums, and then you got a score. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's it. Ta-da! There's your score. Thank you. Well, why look any further? Next. <laughs> and you've got, a, you've got a whole group of producers who have grown up listening to music in a very narrow range, and so they don't actually know what music is like outside of that range. They, they don't know what an orchestra can do. They don't know what a string section can do. They don't do. know what the orchestra sounds like yeah. anymore. They don't no. go to concerts. No. A lot of composers don't go to concerts anymore. Yeah. You know? So it's really, it's a bleak landscape in terms of employment, and you really need to know that. Uh, but given that, it is possible to cobble together a portfolio of activities and make a living in music. Um, but it's hard work. Uh, it requires a lot of sacrifice, and not just sacrifice on your own part but sacrifice on your, your family's part. Absolutely. And I, I've been blessed. My wife and I are married 40 years now. And mm. we've got a 40-year career. And yeah. she is the hero in the room, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, without her support, I could not have, have dared to do this. So. So that's uplifting. Um, <laughs> well, actually, I, I, I was going to mention, I'm, I'm glad y you mentioned this because um, I was talking to Chris, Christopher Young. I took a free class with him, actually. He used to offer a class to young composers who mm. wanted to just get into LA and learn. And um, he said. Do you guys um, know his work? He's really terrific. He's, he's wonderful. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a great writer. Um, and he's very generous to yeah. Extremely composers. generous. Yeah. He really actually has um, a house called the Tilden House, where if you're new in LA, you can apply to live at this house for, I think it's six months just to get on your feet. So very sort of gracious like a composer's generous. monastery, right? <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, cloistered. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Do they have um, liturgy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm not sure it's written down anywhere. <laughs> they don't have. No, they don't have that there, no. But Chris Young said uh, if he, he made a habit of telling people who came to his free class um, that they shouldn't do this. And the ones who said, I'm going to do it anyway, and I'll prove you wrong. They're the ones who might have a chance. And if everyone else got discouraged and said, oh, I can't do it, better they know early. Yeah, that's um, true. It does yeah. favor type A personalities, extroverts, you know. That being said, there's still good work that can be done, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of those things that... that let, let me take a real, a real quick step back. Um, uh, I believe that commercially you do have a chance to write valid music, music that it, it's, whenever you're writing commercially, you're writing music with a very, very specific purpose. And it's not that outside you aren't, you certainly are, but the music that you're writing here, it is for that, it's what it's for. and and with all the input that you get as a composer from however many sides you're getting input from, you can still do something you're proud of. Uh, and we've both been 
uh, we've all been on, on uh, uh, situations where the music is truly lovely. Mm -hmm. It really yes, is right. really, yet it is for yeah. that, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so yes, it can be done, A. B, from, again, from my perspective, you have to have a real solid understanding of the music business to be successful in the music business. A lot of students are, compo are composition students, and they compose and they compose, and somehow they get confused in their head that, that mm -hmm. the quality of this composition is going to be evident to the people you work for out here. And that is, <laughs> if you took your score to your That's banker, <laughs> and he would look at it and go, OK, that's who you're working for. That's he's the guy true. with the checkbook. He's the guy making the investments. He's the guy. He's the guy you're working for. So <laughs> that's really well said, Mike. <laughs> I've never heard it said quite that well. I think. But it, it, it's true, you know. <laughs> it and, is. And, yeah, you're and it's, it's a little right. bit of an over because you have like agents in the middle who are a whole different breed. <laughs> and you have it's 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 a, it's a convoluted, complicated thing. But but. You have to re if you're going to do this, A, you've got to want to be a composer like nothing else. Like, you, you can't see yourself doing anything else. If it's, I'll be a composer, no, I'll be a CPA. I'll, uh, every single day, CPA. A lot less hurdles to jump through. You'll find a job, you'll find insurance, you'll find, uh, life is good. Uh, uh, you, not so much over here. There's no union for composers. There's no benefits That's for composers. Right. There's, uh, you're living from job to job to job, sincerely hoping and praying that you have enough money to pay the mortgage at the end of the month. And if that job comes in, but it doesn't pay you in time, it, it's all a reality here it, as, as far as that goes. There's no regular paycheck involved at all. I mean, there's, there's residuals and things if you're lucky enough to get going and established enough to, to start getting some of those monies rolling in. And those are regular. Those fluctuate, but those are regular. This is one of the ways that being a Christian is actually a yeah. real help. Absolutely. Um, because if you, if you have faith and you, know, and you have the sense of vocation, yeah. that you're called to be a composer, then you can walk forward in that vocation and do it whatever the suffering and whatever is required of you, and if your family understands that vocation and supports you in it, then, it, then you're called to that. Absolutely. And, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't necess necessitate success. No. But it does mean that that's what you've been called to, right. whatever, whatever that road involves. And with that knowledge, you can walk forward and, and do that, and do it with your whole heart. But if, but if you're of two minds, and you don't know that you're called to it, the stress that you're talking about is just oh, yeah. it's tremendous. impressive. Yeah. Well, that's true as a, you don't have to be working in film music for that to be a concern as a no, composer, that's true, right? right? No, that's true. You can be an insurance salesman in yes, as well. Yes. You know, it's, Which is probably a wiser thing to do. I, I have a, 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 dear, a dear old friend of mine, quite honestly, who is, is uh, Sid Page. You know, you know Sid. Yeah. Um, a fabulous violinist yeah. in town who has a son named Cody who graduated Stanford many, many years ago. Uh, went to Stanford with the guys that started Google. And uh, got out of Stanford and went to work with his friends, ha has been there ever since. Now, Cody is this rock and roll, my band, my songs, uh, you know, he's that, he's that guy. 120% that guy. Do you have an address where I can send him my resume? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Just wondering if there was... <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was looking not a bad idea, idea really, come to think of it. Yeah. I mean, so Cody's been at Google for a long, long time and had a great job there, and 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 um, has since you know his band has signed that record deals and his band is successful as far as his band goes. But the point is that Cody goes home and he writes his material for his band and nobody's telling him how to do it, when to do it, why to do it. It's entirely 100% his. He goes to work, Google all day long, paycheck, everything is good, and he can do his music his way 
for his purposes to his heart's content. So there's some freedom in being so able to say. So there's absolutely <laughs> freedom in, in not being, yeah. in not, and not depending upon music to be a business. That's a great point. Yeah. A lot of directors, if you work with directors, not only do they not know anything about music, um, and they think they do, um, <laughs> but they don't know how to communicate with you. So besides having to look at him knowing that, that you're going to get the check from him, um, I had a situation, it's kind of a, a funny, funny thing. Uh, I was working with this guy on, on, on his uh, documentary film, and uh, he wanted a lot of rock and roll because it was youth. So I put to together a band, and I, I wrote this theme and came in with the band. I had the guitar player start out and play a melody, and then the drummer came in, did fills, and we went on from there. Well, this opening theme, which was just just a, a guitar solo. He goes, you know, he goes, I'd like you to, I'd like that to be thicker, you know. And <laughs> I go, okay, <laughs> you know, you know, so I went back and I said, okay, double, double your guitar solo, you know, an, an octave, and I uh, had the bass player start out with this opening solo, uh, and uh, it became solely, you know. The whole band's playing, uh, with the exception of the drummer, is, is playing this melodic line. And it was. It was fatter, it was fuller, and everything. And then the, the band comes in and goes into, into this uh, rock piece. Well, he goes, OK, so when, when they went to have a party to, to show the, the film, what he had done is he, he cut off that solo at the beginning and just moved everything over to the left, and then he looped loop the first first bar of it but he couldn't tell me what what he wanted mm. um, that's just one of several situations of where I, you have to try to figure out what they're what they're wanting out of you probably got stories that are oh my gosh for that. Yeah. so you guys ever had the lineup of suits Oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. So everybody's yes. making a decision yeah, and telling yeah, you yeah. what to do. Yeah, like great. 12 of them. It's Created like by apostles. committee. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. the apostles. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, yeah I, one guy yeah. says he wants this, and, the, and then another producer walks in and goes, you know, I don't quite like that. You need to change that. And, then, and if they're not all in the same room, it's chaos. And the only way that they can establish the bona fides of their own job is by disagreeing with each other. <laughs> so by the time they're done, you have nothing left. There's literally nothing left. So the goal is, of course, to find out who the real boss is. And yeah. then yeah. It's, yeah. there's, there's two, two it's quick the stories. the seven-year-old nephew of, yeah, of the uh, 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 executive uh, uh, producer. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. 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 Always he's going to take it home and play for him. You know the story about the producer? <laughs> He's given the recording you know, to take home and, and respond to on Monday morning. He comes back Monday morning, and uh, they say, well, what did you think? And he says, I don't know. I was the only one who listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, you're all still working in this industry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here's a perfect example of a composer working in town. Um, and on, on this line. There was a director I worked, there's a movie that happened a long time ago, and the director was a percussionist in college. Be very careful. Um, I was going to say a word. <laughs> because the, now he knows a little bit about, but not enough, but enough to be dangerous. And so this composer had been around and around and around and we're on the fifth or sixth day the final day of recording this thing the last hour we're doing the end credits of this movie and it's big and and it's we're out of time and it's really on edge and this guy from the, it was a big orchestra out tadio uh, and and this in, in, in the booth behind us comes a voice to the to <laughs> only the band was hearing him about about rewriting the, the percussion because it would make the whole thing. Now, this, th this thing had been written and rewritten and bought off on a long. So now it's time to rewrite everything now. And, yeah. But there's, there's no time to, because it's like, it's. Uh, <laughs> and the composer's up there ripping his hair out, just trying to get this thing done with. It's, it's been days now, and it's like, and this composer. And the reason why this composer works is because his initial reaction is, 
you know, that's a great idea. I was just thinking that. Let's throw the liar. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. And the other end of the story, and the sad part of the story, is the last time I worked for Maurice Jarre, mm. many, many years ago, mm. fabulous composer yeah. back then, mm. was on a movie that, that there were, and he was big into synthesizers back then, and so we, were, mm. we had like six of us or five of us in a room. All of our rigs. <laughs> Probably wrote more diminished chords for him than any any oh, other composer. Oh, exactly. <laughs> and so, so it was it was me and seven and a few other synth guys, in, all in a circle in this room. And he would he would write something out on a piece of paper and and Xerox this piece of paper and come around to each of us and say, okay, you, I want you to play this part on this kind of, and then you, I want you to play this part, and, 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 and that was his process back then. So one more, or on the second day of recording this thing. And the first hour, we're going fine. And we noticed that, you know, along the back of the room, the first hour, all of a sudden, the row of seats gets filled, like, filled with suits. Mm -hmm. Row of suits by the end of the first hour. And took a break. And we came back from the break. And the suits, we noticed the suits, and Maurice had gone outside. and and. We came back in after our break and got sat down and started getting sounds together for the next thing. And Maurice finally walks back in, packs up his briefcase, gets his coat, and he walks out. Didn't say a word. Oh no! Didn't say. And they and they fired him right on, on the spot. And that was. Yeah, you're not really part of the club until you've been fired from. Uh, club, yes, so. yes, and there's been amazing composers yeah. that have been yeah, fired all of them. from. Yeah, all it's been uh, it's a lovely business. It's a well, I mean, all of this is to is to to not address the elephant in the living room, which is we don't really know how you get and keep a job in Hollywood. <laughs> <Yeah. right? laughs> <No. laughs> Honestly, I mean, right? I yes. mean, yeah, uh, you're right. You, you yeah. never know what's coming around the corner. Yeah, it's so a complete don't. surprise. Yeah. Kind so the right. comment about um, Providence is, is interesting. I was actually thinking it because of the birds reference that we made earlier. But they don't worry about where their food's going to come from. Um, and the, the flowers don't worry about what clothes they're going to wear. And so I, working in this industry, just from your example, is daily an exercise in calling and in faith that you're going to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to transition just a little bit. Yeah. Just to add to that, or not. Hmm. Because, because you may be called out of it just as you were called into it. Hmm. And you have to always be open to that possibility. The people who get destroyed on the reefs of, of, of these uh, kinds of jobs are the ones that can't be flexible, that can't change. Right. They've mm -hmm. built so much of their identity around being right. this thing instead of being Bingo. about what God wants that, them to that's be. That's it. Absolutely. And it becomes an idol when that happens. Yeah. And that, that, that kills you. Well, so that's, this is actually a great turning point because um, I have the, the mission statement of uh, the CFAMC, and I just want to read the first bit of it. Uh, CFAMC seeks to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and help build his kingdom by encouraging the work and witness of Christian composers of symphonic and chamber music, opera, and other concert works. We pray that believers will embrace our musical integrity because of our Christian witness and that our commitment to musical excellence will allow us to bring our Christian witness to the wider art music world. And I feel like you could read those two sentences and just replace art music with film music. And I'm curious what walking out your faith looks like. Viola does a good job of talking about business as missions. Hollywood is a mission field. Like We want to equip students to go out of the world with a solid foundation and a faith in Jesus that will propel them and protect them maybe, or at, at the very least, that they can fall back on. What does it look like to be uh, Christians in a field just like secular art music that is often hostile to what you believe? How do you get the job done? How do you stay faithful? How do you be a witness? All the things that this organization already believes, what does that look like in your day to day? Hmm. Either way, you got everybody's to looking at that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not as easy as it sounds. Um, it didn't even sound easy. <laughs> no, and it's even harder than that. Um, you know, it, it's, it's funny. Um, Ralph Winter was here. And he, uh, so he, most of you should know Ralph Winter. He, he did the uh, executive produce the 
X-Men series and some of the Star Trek movies. Uh, and he just made a statement is, is I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not going to stand with my 300 pound Bible on the corner uh, of a Paramount lot. Um, but he said at the same time, I'm going to stand strong in, in what I believe. I, I've had situations, um, there's, there's two things about this. Number one is, is I'll just give you one, one instance. Uh, I'm, I'm on the board, uh, the executive board of the Society of Composers and Lyricists. Great organization. And yeah, it's... VSCL.org, I think it is, right? Uh, VSCL.com. Dot com. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, Hannah and, and uh, Melissa and some of our students have joined there. It's very beneficial for them, I think. But our board members are a rather eclectic group. Um, we have Jewish people. Uh, we have people who are so hard left you just can't imagine. And, um, and different people living in different lifestyles. And um, there's one person that, that I have developed a friendship with um, uh, who is gay. And uh, my first contact with this person was uh, she was complaining about those evangelical Christians, and we were sitting in a in a conference, a, you know, composers conference like this. And I said, "Hold it!" I said, "That's where I come from. That's what I am." And I said, "You know, you can't castigate all the evangelical Christians just based on this TV evangelist that you're talking about." Because that was part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, I mean, we we just maintained, but I I worked at being friendly to her, and. Um, so over time, uh, what's happened is, is now the doors have really opened up um, and we get to talk and we're working together. And um, the, other, the other side of it is, is the integrity of your work. You know, that's, that's your biggest calling, calling card. So if you're, if you're going in, uh, what was it uh, Father Moody said last night about the quality of your music? Uh, and the integrity of your music. That is one of the most important things as, as well. Uh, so uh, we have some pretty heavy people on this board and um, I was a little afraid to Arthur Hamilton's on our board. Arthur wrote uh, Crimea River. Uh, that's his huge standard and he's very, very well known in town. And, um, and he's known to be tough, not, not negative. He's a, he's a real gentleman. Uh, but developing that relationship uh, uh, took time. Yeah. And part of it was, too, his wife and my wife just absolutely adore each other. And um, so, you know, there's a combination of personal relationship happening besides, yeah. you know. But I, I, when I, I was almost afraid to give Arthur, you know, because he, he's this icon, uh, one of my demos, and um, he sent me a, back an email. And he said, "You know, I'd like, I like this one piece. Uh, if it's available, I want to write lyrics to it." Well, unfortunately, EMI owned that piece, so <laughs> we had to go a different route. But, um, but um, yeah, it's those are those. I think are the two things. Uh, you don't want to necessarily be in your face, but you want to stand strong and 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 live with integrity among the people you're working with. Yeah, I just want to add a comment to that. Uh, I, I um, think that the excellence of your work uh, is is one of the most important things. Yeah. Uh, and it, it means appropriateness for the function of that work. When you're writing for something specific, mm -hmm. the excellence means that you don't try and bring another agenda to it and, and overwrite or write something different than what is required. It means that you're a servant. Mm -hmm. You're a servant of a project that has particular uh, parameters attached to it, and you're also the servant of the people for whom you are writing counterpoint to one of their gr dreams of life. They have written uh, a script, or they are directing a script, or they are producers, and you are writing counterpoint to, to their work. And so integrity means, fundamentally for a film composer, a form of servanthood. And mm -hmm. that's been the biggest thing about my faith, um, is, is learning to see myself as a servant to other people and to, uh, to other ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and where, where the personal aspect comes in, it's particularly important to remember that 
um, there are only image bearers that you are working for. Mm. Every single one of us, whatever our ideas, whatever our persuasions, whatever our worldviews, we are all created in the image of God. My sins are no more attractive to God than mm. anyone else's. And um, so we are working with I mean, Lewis said it best in The Weight of Glory, which is a sermon that you should read every year. <laughs> <laughs> to remind you, you know, that we are working with image bearers every mm. day. And even though they may be behaving badly, you behave badly in, in, your, own, you know, in your own ways at, at various times. And this is the journey of life. And it's, it's a struggle to, um, to remind yourself to see them in, the, in those mm. terms, to see people in those terms, everyone, yeah. your own family, your, your, your uh, colleagues, and that you were serving. Yeah. I once heard someone, uh, I think, actually, I think uh, my wife was at a seminar with an assistant director who said, just remember that everyone who you talk to is fighting their own personal battle every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just remember, everyone you engage with, they're engaged in this eternal battle. Um, and this guy wasn't a Christian. It's just that everyone has a battle yeah. in their soul. Um, yeah. And that's just life. If you're that's a Christian in Hollywood, you are a mute witness. You don't get to speak 99.9% <laughs> of the time. Whatever your witness is, it comes through your body, through your work, through whatever other things than your words. Yeah. You're a mute witness. Yeah, but people know. They somehow know. I don't know yeah, how they, they do, do, but they do. They somehow <laughs> figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, uh, we have, I'm going to take five minutes. And uh, open it up if there are any questions for our panel. This is the part we should leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is sort of going to be a question. I want to see if I can get what I'm trying to get here. But, um, I'll repeat can, it. Can you stand, stand up and be a little... Oh, yeah. Sorry. Just stand up. Yeah, sure. go ahead. Um, <laughs> On your hand. Turn around. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have been talking about... You've sort of made a schism between concert music and film music. And... Um, talked about conveying, Mr. Redford especially, you talked about conveying a message um, through concert music, using, using that uh, as a, to, to bear a message in response to God's beauty and that sort of thing. And then you've also talked about doing excellent things in the film industry for the glory of God, those sorts of things, and, and your relationships in the film industry. But is it possible, in any sense, to, to use your music um, in the film industry to contribute to a message in film? Or is it, have you been a part of any of that? Or is, do you think that that is a calling in film music is to contribute to a message through a film? Or, or is, that, is that an aspect of being a Christian film composer? Are you sort of asking whether you can still glorify God even though you're working on a film and not just, it's not a work on its own. Exactly, I, and, and I may be asking, do you work off Hollywood, or do you work, you know, um, what, what that means to, 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 to use your music to contribute to a message. Uh, you know, in Hollywood, of course, you're, you're trying to fit a specific, like, here's what we need for this film. Um, but is there a way to, to, to within that, or otherwise, Sometimes. the glory of God? Uh, yeah, well, you glorify God by, by uh, by working as a servant, um, that your, the glory is given to God through the nature of your service to the, to the project. If you join the army, you don't get to question every order. And some of those orders are going to be, uh, you know, horrible to you. Um, you're, you're working for somebody else's vision. So the message that your music will carry is essentially the message of someone else most of the time. Your message comes through in the craft, in the quality of your work, and in the quality of your service. Um, so it's kind of a little more literalistic than I'm comfortable with to talk about message in those terms. Because music is, a, uh, is fundamentally another language other than words it's not that does not convey a literalistic message, per se. You're not, you're not articulating um, canons of the gospel or something you know, when, you're, when you're writing music. You are doing some, you're using language that is intended for something else. You know, and, and when you're writing for a film, you're writing for someone else's project. You're writing counterpoint to something that somebody has already conceived. So those are limitations. Well, yeah, I was about to get to that. Yeah, there are occasionally situations that come up where you can take a, a particular point of view 
in the music. And sometimes you're actually allowed to do that, um, <laughs> but m many times not. Most yeah. of the time not. Most of the time it's dictated to you how you were to approach a sequence. But I had a, a, an experience where um, my wife was just reminding me of um, where uh, it was a uh, TV movie that I had agreed to do. And, I was, and uh, when I actually saw the movie, there were some difficult sequences. There was one sequence that was particularly um, sexually provocative, um, but I'd already signed on to do the project. Am I going to quit the project or am I going to stay with it? Um, fortunately, the, the sexual uh, scene was, uh, the activities were engaged in by the villains. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> and so, and so it, was, it was possible to use the music to help underscore the villainy of of these people in this sequence, thereby making a statement about the nature of th those behaviors, and so I wrote horror music. <laughs> so it's a, it's a it's kind of a sexual scene with this incredibly dissonant, you know, uh, nasty sounding music behind it, and nobody could come away from that sequence thinking that this was a good idea. <laughs> you know, that was my that was my little flag hoisted on the. You know, <laughs> but you know, it was right for the scene. Now, if the scene had been shot and, and written in a different way, I would have had to write st standard love music for that. And that, that would not have been a happy thing, but I had joined the army. So I, you either quit the army, you either desert, quit the army, or you, you try and do to the best of your ability. You are never gonna find a film that will be 100% reflective of your theology, yeah. never. Yeah. Uh, so it's always this is a, even and, Christian and films, and especially uh, in Hollywood. Maybe, maybe yeah, especially maybe Christian a lot. Films. Yeah. So you have to you have to be willing to be. I, I won't use the word compromise because everybody hates that word. But you've got to be flexible. You've got to be able to figure out a way to a way to find where your service and your and your uh, the integrity of your craft mm -hmm. can play out in a difficult situation. But you know what? If you're banking at Bank of America, you've got the same problem. I mean, anywhere in the culture, you, you do not get to be free of that problem. You're going to somehow support iniquity, <laughs> where, you know, somewhere <laughs> yeah, we in live, your life. We, you can't it's not withdraw. the promised land, right? We live yeah. in Babylon. To some exactly. Extent. You cannot yeah. withdraw entirely from that, uh, totally. from that proposition. So, you know, there was somebody over here, I think. I'll just, I'll, I'll ask very simply. Yeah, we have, unfortunately, we have time for one more because we do have another concert coming up, so okay, go just, for it. Just very quickly, is there any hope for the Christian film industry? Whoa, <laughs> just a quick question. <laughs> wow. Because there's, a, you know, it's, it's uh, there's always that tension. How do we, yes how do we and no. How the money and how do we tell a story <laughs> without breaking our, our rules, you know? I'll answer like the elves answer Frodo, you know, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, you, you, don't, you don't really know the answer to that question. It's, no. um, it's intriguing what's going on, but uh, the, the industry itself is going to change the Christians who participate in it. Uh, what the nature and the, and the volume of that change is going to be, we have yet to see. I think, yep, oh, go ahead. Um, I, it's, uh, Again, from my perspective, I believe that if a Christian writer writes a script and wants it to be done and God wants it to be done, it's going to get done. Um, as far as there being an industry for it, that's hard to really say. I don't know. Um, yeah, you're not entitled to success just because you make Christian film, well, no, or even a good film. No, no. You know, yeah. when I worked on the... Uh, a good Christian film, which is rare. Well... <laughs> well, <it's true. laughs> well, I think there's something to be said uh, for, I think everyone on the panel here would agree, tell good stories. Tell yeah, the best absolutely. stories. Yeah, exactly. Well, tell right. the truth about your character. Right, I think um, yeah. Yeah. Th if, if someone um, spends all of their time telling you what you should believe and then and none of their time actually acting like that, telling, actually living out a good story, you're not going to believe them. It's going to be snake oil. Um, but if you actually spend your life telling that good story and living as though the world is, simply is a certain way, 
that'll resonate. And I think that's probably well, that's true for all the, all the music you that's want. Exactly, that's exactly, exactly right. right. That's, that's exactly, exactly right. right. You know. um, can we, I didn't mean to have the last word. I just, uh, oh, we're out of time. Well so. done, moderator. <laughs> um, with that, we're going to close up. Can we have a hand for our panelists, please? Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.